These aircraft, flying in United States Air Force livery, are examples of what was the mainstay of Western fighter might for over 20 years. Used by the majority of the West's air forces, it was originally conceived and very successfully employed as a Navy fleet defense fighter. During its lengthy tenure, it's been referred to under several pseudonyms, including the St. Louis Slugger and the Double Ugly, but it's better known by its proper name as the Phantom II. Here, preparing to take off in May 1978, is the 5,000th production Phantom II, painted in a special celebratory colour scheme. Soon the festive paint job would disappear beneath the camouflage of the Turkish Air Force. But, flying low over St. Louis, the brightly coloured plane cannot help but have attracted attention. At the controls is Bob Little, who took the first of the type into the air for its first flight 20 years before. A few days earlier, on the 24th of May 1978, others who were closely involved with the evolution of the Phantom had gathered to admire the celebration plane when it was first presented to the public. Product of McDonald's famous design team, the F-4 Phantom represents the Western Alliance's greatest post-war fighter success story, and the plane must have been close to a few hearts in the room. However, doubtless, the Phantom II meant even more to this man, for this is James McDonnell, Mr. Mack under whose leadership the Phantom II's namesake first started the company on the road to success over 40 years before. In 1943, McDonnell Aviation was merely a subcontractor, supplying parts and assembling aircraft for other manufacturers, when the Navy asked it to design its first jet-powered carrier-based fighter. The project did not have a high priority within the Defence Department at the time, but McDonnell seized the opportunity with alacrity and produced a plane whose shape was, for the time, revolutionary and which was to affect aircraft production for years to come. It bore features that have become almost signatures of later McDonnell aircraft, not least of which are the dual engines. Although, at that time, twin engines were an almost absolute necessity due to the unreliability of the early jets, McDonnell have only built one plane which did not have two engines. As Mr. Mack said, two engines will bring the boys back home more likely than one. Navy colour scheme, the sleek lines allow the name Phantom easily. The first of the famous St. Louis Ghost Fighters had arrived. The new technology would be a challenge for engineers and pilots alike. Jet aircraft simply did not work the same way as their predecessors. We can make a comparison here with the bulk of the F-8 Corsair, possibly the most powerful piston-engined aircraft ever built, almost dwarfing the slim, sophisticated and considerably faster Phantom. As aircrew gained familiarity with the technology, 
it became obvious to all that the jet would soon totally supersede piston engines. But the first Phantoms, like other American jet aircraft, were not to see service in World War II, as they arrived too late. However, 60 examples of the Phantom were built, and it had the distinction of being the first American jet aircraft to be successfully deployed on carriers. The prototype, which was the only plane completed before VJ Day, also had the distinction of being the Navy's fastest aircraft of World War II. The basic design of the Phantom was so sound that it merely needed refinement and considerably more powerful engines to take the form of McDonald's F2, the Banshee. The Banshee was not only successful as an airplane, but also commercially. Nearly 900 were produced in a few short years, and many saw active service in Korea. With such a large order, McDonald's plant expanded as it cemented itself as a leader in the new era of jet aviation. But, as is always the case in such matters, to maintain that reputation and the company's competitive advantage, a more advanced design had to be developed. The next major step in aviation was the adoption of the swept wing. And employing the new principle, McDonnell put forward the F3 Demon. The Demon was the only single-engined production aircraft ever to come from McDonnell. And although a basically sound design, it never delivered its predicted performance, due in the main to the failure of the engine to deliver the specified power. It could only reach supersonic speeds in a shallow dive. By the early 50s, Chance Fort, one of McDonald's competitors, was offering a truly supersonic Navy fighter in the form of the Crusader. To counter the challenge from Chance Fort, McDonnell proposed a more advanced demon and developed several concepts which featured its original premise that two engines were better than one. But in the end, the Navy chose the all-new Crusader. McDonnell had taken some of the features of the Demon and put it through a process of advanced design refinement. In the end, they arrived at the plan which is now known as the Classic Phantom. The wings have always been of particular interest, with the raised outer surfaces countered by the drooped tail sections. It was a truly distinctive shape, and was one that would be recognised for many years to come. Undaunted by their lack of success, McDonnell persisted with the design, and finally won a small order. It has often been speculated that this work was given to the company to ensure that the McDonnell design team remained intact as a defence resource. This is a wooden mock-up of the Phantom, as it was first shown to the Navy. The project approved, the plane was designated the FH-41 and the first rolled out of the St. Louis factory on the 8th of May 1958. 
to be given the name of its predecessor, McDonald's first jet, the Phantom. Bob Little took the new plane up for its first flight a fortnight later, on the 27th. The flight was not without incident, as with a failure in the main hydraulics, it was abandoned without any attempt to proceed to supersonic speeds as originally hoped. The next flight was beset by the same fault, but on the third attempt, things went smoothly and the great potential of the magnificent aircraft became apparent. Little made a comment after his first successful flights that was to become famous. This time we've got a winner. With confidence in the Phantom II vindicated, it went into production, soon to be deployed in service as the Navy's fleet defence fighter, an aircraft whose purpose was to protect carriers against attack. With a truly successful aircraft on their hands, the Navy took the opportunity to celebrate the 50th anniversary of naval aviation with a grab of records, beginning a succession that would see the plane set the greatest collection of records ever gained by a single aircraft type. The first was the absolute height record, which took the Phantom to 98,557 feet. Had the plane edged a little higher to the 100,000 foot mark, the pilot would have officially become an astronaut. Further records followed in a quick sequence of projects, including Skyburner, which saw the king of records, the straight line speed dash, raised to 2.6 times the speed of sound. Another project was Sage Burner, where the Phantom hurtled over the desert, 50 foot up, at 902 miles an hour. This latter put an enormous strain on both pilot and plane. But as Vietnam was to reinforce, these were planes that could take phenomenal punishment and still deliver the goods. By 1960, the F-4s were entering service with the Navy and the vital shakedown period had begun as the Navy personnel became accustomed to their new plane, testing it in its job with the regular dangerous, difficult and stressful processes of carrier takeoffs and landings. The Navy aviators soon reached the same conclusion as the McDonnell test pilots and a 20-year affinity between the aircraft and the service had begun. Not long before, no one had wanted the new fighter. But by 1961, other eyes were speculatively studying the superb performance of the Navy's new plane. The United States Air Force had, up to this time, considered its F-106 Delta Dart its most valuable interceptor. But although the Air Force is traditionally loath to buy Navy aircraft, the Phantom's performance could not be overlooked particularly as its achievements were radically enhanced by that most useful of combat assets, the second crew member. An opportunity to compare the two aircraft was quickly arranged and the results were conclusive. 
the Air Force simply had to have the McDonnell plan and ordered it as the standard weapon system for TAC units. The major modifications between the Navy and Air Force versions were not great and Air Force production proceeded quickly. This was just as well because a trying test was ahead. Navy F-4 Phantoms were the first to see service in Vietnam where they gave escort cover to A-8 and A-7 attack aircraft as well as filling their role as fleet defence fighters, protecting the carrier task forces. Controlled from the carriers or from airborne radar, the F-4s protected the Navy's ships and aircraft alike. These aircraft are from VF-84, Jolly Roger Squadron, which saw considerable service in Vietnam. But the all-time naval ace in the Southeast Asian conflict was from VF-96. He was Randy Cunningham, seen here on the right with his partner Willie Driscoll. Cunningham shot down five enemy planes. On one particular day, he shot down three MiGs before his Phantom was hit by a surface-to-air missile and grievously damaged. Still, the plane limped out over the coast and the two men spent some time in the water before being rescued. Cunningham took his job deadly seriously and would often spend time reading on the tactics of pilots in previous conflicts, from which he drew lessons which he could apply to the Vietnamese situations. Generally, the North Vietnamese used MiGs, which were invariably lighter than the F-4s. But although this gave them a higher manoeuvrability, they were far less sophisticated planes. Later F-4s were fitted with an added leading edge slot to increase their responsiveness, but even without this, the Phantom's combination of high speed, advanced radar technology, and the benefit of the second man 
proved a winning combination. Not all MiG kills would go to the Navy, as the Air Force F-4s were also deployed to Vietnam, and the St. Louis Slogger began a new success in Asian camouflage. The Air Force's first ace was Lieutenant Steve Ritchie. He, like his Navy counterparts, could attest to the Phantom's prowess in dealing with the lightweight MiGs. Although Robin Olds never got his fifth MiG, he was one of the most colourful and respected pilots. Seen here landing after his third MiG kill, Olds had an extremely successful career in World War II, with no less than 24 downed German aircraft to his credit. The experience that he brought to Vietnam, teamed with the F-4, must have been a mighty asset to the Air Force. Most of the MiG kills were with missiles, either the short-range Sidewinders or the larger medium-range Sparrow shown here. The missile would sit, semi-recessed, under the F-4, being released just before firing. Missilery of this sophistication tended to keep enemy aircraft well away. The early Phantoms, designed for a role that kept intruders at bay, were not equipped with an internal gun. Something of a makeshift arrangement, seen here being laboriously loaded, was the 26mm Vulcan rotary cannon mounted in a gun pod. It gave a nominal cannon capacity with the added advantage of being easily demounted and replaced. These gun pods were usually carried under the main fuselage. However, it was possible to fit up to three using wing points, giving the Phantom an astounding firepower. The guns were capable of firing 6,000 rounds in a minute. But in such a configuration, they lacked accuracy and were not suitable for dogfighting with one of the nimble MiGs. The addition of cannon to the F-4 was something the pilots had been pressing for, but it was not until the E model that an E-36 Gatling gun was finally fitted internally some years later. Here, the crew of an F-4 recently fitted with the pod stencil a new badge onto the plane, that of a gunfighter.
Despite the Air Force's disappointed hopes that the external guns would be the answer to the MiGs, they did find them highly successful for strafing, where their lack of accuracy was less critical. The plane that had started operations as a Navy defence fighter now quietly took over the entire battlefield over Vietnam, absorbing a number of roles and becoming an increasingly recognisable and welcome sight to the Americans on the ground. The enormous lifting power of the McDonnell giant was such that it could, in close support, deploy weaponry from an array to match virtually any need. Here, early C models, the initial Air Force configuration, prepare for a ground attack mission with a payload of rockets and bombs heavier than that carried by the B-17 heavy bomber of World War II. Prior to the F-4, the standard and very successful tactical fighter bomber was the F-105 Thunder Chief, whose design dated back to 1950. It coupled very high speed with an internal bomb bay capable of delivering nuclear weapons. In Vietnam, the bomb bays contained fuel, and external racks festooned with bombs had been their usual attire. They had suffered a process of attrition in the intense air defences of Vietnam, and their logical and available replacement was the Phantom. From bases in Vietnam and Thailand, the bomb-laden Phantoms would fly missions all over Vietnam, regularly to Hanoi. Overhead would prowl their MiG cap, fighter escort protection. Planes of exactly the same mark, more Phantoms.
Possibly the most vital link in the aerial war over Vietnam was the KC-135 tanker. Almost all the USAF aircraft types deployed in Vietnam needed refueling in their average mission due to their high fuel consumption. This was affected by a number of factors. Among them, the fuel needed to take off hauling extremely high loads, the drag of the external stores and their racks, and the need for planes over the north to constantly travel as fast as they could go, using maximum fuel in coping with the air defences. Hence the slow but vital procession of planes queuing to refuel, from a tanker that may have come from as far away as the Philippines. This small armada of aircraft is now on its way, fully fuelled, fully armed, and with F-4 fighters escorting, safe, or at least as safe as the North Vietnamese defences would permit. The air war in Vietnam was hard fought. The fighter escort might have kept the MiGs at bay, but they could do nothing to lessen the dangers of low-level anti-aircraft artillery and high-level surface-to-air missiles, SAMs. Hanoi and its outlying areas were gradually armed with nests of multiple SAM launchers and their radar scanners. With a formidable defence network operating, the losses to the bombing forces rose alarmingly, becoming unsustainable. SAMs were cheap, highly efficient and mobile, and had to be countered. Soon the Air Force was deploying new weapons to suppress the threat. The first electronics countermeasures aircraft were converted B-66 bombers, fitted with sophisticated high-powered jamming devices to distort the SAM radar reception and suppress the use of the deadly rockets until the bombers had passed. Working in their darkened hull, these technicians must have saved thousands of lives.
Another answer came in the form of the two-seater variant of the venerable Thunder Chiefs. Re-equipped with the second crewman operating a new array of electronics, they turned into hunter killers, using their equipment to locate SAMs through their radar signals and attack them with the deadly Shrike missiles, which homed in on the SAM sites. The SAMs began to be surgically removed, one at a time. These special units were referred to as wild weasels and wrote another chapter into the story of the F-105. Their natural replacement, two-seated, fast and strong, as it had been as they dwindled under the weight of the bombing campaign, was the F-4. If you look on the extreme right of this phantom, you may note the telltale Shrike missile under the wing, a wild weasel. There were still losses, of course, from the SAMs, and the MiGs and the artillery, or even as the result of accidents far away from the conflict. Some Phantoms didn't make it back to their bases. And some that did only barely made it. Working in close cooperation with the other observation aircraft, the F-4 did the job, day in and day out. Flybat 151 is presently in the area. We are base plus seven. Our armament is CBU and Napalm with some 20 mic mic. Do you have anything for us out there? Uh, Raj, no, but, uh, stand by one. I think we've got a suspected truck park and storage area down here. We want to have you take a look at Oh, we've got a couple of lights down here. Go rack around the left here, go take a look. Oh, okay, then Rob, we're gonna pull around here and kick out a few flares for you, and then you go down and take a look and see what's happening. Roger. Okay, load map the load up four in the rear, will you? Roger, sir, load four. Okay, then Rob, we're kicking about now. Got your flares in sight now, uh, Blind Bat. I'm going to start down. Roger, roger. And uh, you should be able to see the buildings and stuff like that just as the forward makes the bend in the river there. Looks like. We're picking up some ground fire down there, it looks like. I'm going to have to change my running heading. I'll uh, still uh, turn left here and keep clear of you. Another McDonnell aircraft to see considerable action in Vietnam was the RF-101 Voodoo. This was a reconnaissance version of a long-range fighter. The RF-101s played a vital role in Vietnam, where it was used not only to photograph potential targets, but, possibly of considerably more importance, to take post-mission photographs. These aircraft, mostly unarmed, would fly in sometime shortly after the bombers to establish the facts. It was said that within 24 hours of a mission, the photographs would be on a desk in the Pentagon. You can see the strong family resemblance between the Voodoo and the Phantom, the same raised rear section and the same commitment to two engines. However, the 101s, like the F-105, were out of the early 50s century series, and they too were approaching the end of their service life. And there was only one logical replacement around at the time, the F-4 Phantom. Now with a completely redesigned nose, housing powerful cameras and infrared sensors, some Phantoms would become RF-4 reconnaissance planes, the needle nose just ahead of the forward camera distinguishing them from others of the mark. Phantom escorts guarded Phantom bombers while Phantom wild weasels prowled protectively to a target that had been photographed by a Phantom who would be coming back after them to photograph the damage.
After dashing through enemy airspace to the target, came the equal dash to get home so that the photographs could be processed and analysed. Results from that day's mission confirmed or clarified, and tactical decisions for the next day to be planned. More missions for the fleets of Phantoms. But the Phantom is not only a reputation as a combat weapon, its power and flexibility enabled it to be adopted for display use. Not only has it been used by the fabled Thunderbirds precision aerobatics team, thrilling crowds with a display of grace and skill, but also by the Navy's Blue Angels. As such, the Phantom is the only aircraft ever to have been flown by both services' display teams at the same time. By the mid-1960s, not only was the Phantom in demand to meet American requirements, but it was also being built under license in Britain and Japan. A further nine air forces were supplied from the St. Louis plant, including Israel. The Israeli Phantoms have seen considerable use including action over the Bekaa Valley. The F-4 also found Middle Eastern service with the Egyptian Air Force, where it replaced many of the Soviet aircraft which had been previously arrayed against it in Vietnam. Here, Egyptian Air Force F-4Es, with their chin-mounted cannon, practice alongside American F-4s of the Tactical Air Command, over a landscape composed of history.
Now, as the decade ends, well over 30 years from its maiden flight, crews of the United States Air Force are still being trained on the ways of the Phantom. Nowadays, its frontline service in US livery is more confined to its mastery of photo reconnaissance, a role that it made its own in the Vietnamese skies 20 years ago. It speaks volumes for the plane that it can still be serviced and maintained to a point where there is no need to consider replacing it in this particular role for another decade to come. To build anything better would be hard and very, very expensive. By the time it is replaced, it will be approaching its 50th anniversary. Here, TAC RF-4s on reconnaissance work carefully comb an area as part of an exercise designed to ensure that the Phantoms and their crews are tuned to constant readiness. In any foreseeable conflict, reconnaissance will be as important as it was in Vietnam, and the role for the moment rests easily with the Phantoms. If ever there was a plane for all seasons, as far as jet aviation is concerned, none could lay more claim to the title than the F-4 Phantom.